Hello. Um, welcome. This is about the High Renaissance. We call the period of the greatest explosion of talent and, and artistry in the Renaissance, the High Renaissance. We started with the pre-Renaissance, remember, 1300s, then with the Trecento, then we went to the 1400s. The 1400s are the Quattrocento, that's the early Renaissance. And from the middle of the 1400s to the first quarter of the 1500s is when things pick up speed. And in that, you know, last quarter of the 1400s, first quarter of the 1500s, it's a short time, but it's explosive. It's the greatest uh, sort of production of uh, masterpieces. That is the High Renaissance. How do we know about this? We know about this because of Giorgio Vasari. Vasari was the historian of the Renaissance, an artist that lived and, uh, and shared with many of these people. And he basically, um, he wrote a book called The Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects of Italy. Anyway, so when we're talking about the High Renaissance, we're talking about great advances in architecture, painting, sculpture. Basically, the aim was, all right, the Romans were good, we're gonna beat the Romans. We're gonna be even better than the Romans, than the Greeks. We're gonna be, we're gonna just take this town and transform the universe. And they did, and they did. Listen, these are the monsters of the Renaissance. These are the sacred cows. This is the top of the top. You know Leonardo, Da Vinci. You have Michelangelo. You have Raphael. And these are the guys we all know. Because we know the Ninja Turtles, right? Uh, no, these are the classic ones, we all know them. But there are more. There are three that you might not know so much. And these are um, camera. Do we get it here? If I, if I come here? Okay. Bramante, an architect. Giorgione, a painter. And Titian, another painter. So I need you to remember all of them. These are the six monsters, the six sacred cows, you know, of the Renaissance. Um, and you can look them up. I'm not going to put up with the board. Michelangelo Buonarroti, uh, Raphael Sanzio. I mean, they have longer names. But of course, we know them all as Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael. Actually, in English, sorry. My Spanish is coming through. Raphael. Uh, Bramante, Regione, and Titian. What are, you know, this is school, so we do have to remember some things, you know, and what are the similarities? What brings them together? Because their work looks different. Well, number one, they copy and idealize nature. Okay, the world is their classroom. They look at dead bodies, they look at plants, they look at buildings, they look at people, they look at everything and they copy it. And when they copy it and you see those drawings, you say, oh my God, how can you draw something so perfectly? So there's that, or they paint it, or they make a building or whatever. So they replicate, idealize nature. Number two, they rely and understand on the forms of antiquity, the arches, all right? The naked statues of men, uh, you know, from antiquity. They, they understand them, they, they get it, and they, they copy them for their own. So they're not only copying from the world and reality, they're copying from the art of antiquity, classic Greece and ancient Rome. Again, ba and then balance and clarity. One of the reasons these are the best sellers in art is that even if you're, if you're from, from wherever you are, like the United States or Europe, from Africa or Asia, from Australia or Cuba, you know, it is clear, you understand the picture, okay? Because there is balance and clarity. They're very balanced pictures, okay? And finally, they have emotional power. So I need you to remember one, two, three, these four things, okay? Reliance on nature, reliance on antiquity, balance and clarity, and emotional power. All, and, and ask yourself, when you look at their pieces, where's the emotional power? Ah, 
Okay, where's the balance and clarity? Ah, okay, where's the reliance in antiquity? Oh, look at that. Oh, where is the reliance in nature? That kind of thing. And, um, and of course, you know, this is the time also when we get to the genius. You know, like everybody's a genius now. Right? Oh, you know, my roommate, she's a genius. Oh, you know, my friend, he's a genius. You know, we're all geniuses, but this is the emergence of the word genius, okay? Because these guys are real, real geniuses. And um, in their life, a lot of them, particularly this guy and this guy, because they lived the longest, they lived a long life. They were revered. They were geniuses in their lifetime. People knew, they were like, oh my God, that's, that's a genius and he's alive. So that was very, very important. The other thing, some of you might not be artists, but maybe you will back up artists. As important perhaps as this artist are the Medici. And the word Medici means a patron of the arts and it comes from the Renaissance. It comes from Florence because the guy that put on here this comes from a family, the Medici family, okay? And the Medici family were immensely wealthy, but they invested a lot of this wealth in some of the greatest art the world has known. And so when you have a patron, you call him a Medici or her a Medici. In this regard, we're talking about a prestigious character who helped and, you know, and invests on the art, okay? Now, what's happening as we keep moving in history? We are in Italy. We have, there's a threat. Italy is under threat. The Turks, you know, coming from Istanbul, from Turkey, you know, they're starting, you know, like they're coming over to try to invade. The French, you know, uh, from the north are also trying to invade some of the city-states in Italy. And of course, Milan, Florence, they're at it, okay? They're fighting. So there's a little bit of a mess, you know? And then the Pope in Rome also wants a little chunk of change in land. So, I mean, you're talking about a, a tender, a, a, a powerful, explosive situation. And then there's also Martin Luther, the Protestants. So there are some guys in Germany saying, no, we don't want to belong to the Catholic Church anymore. No, we don't believe the church is corrupt. We don't. So it's a very, very dynamic period, you know, the end of the 1400s to the beginning of the 1500s. So, you know, in this climate, you still have very powerful people, super f f rich families, and one guy, one guy, Lorenzo di Medici. Lorenzo, Lorenzo di Medici, he was called Il Magnifico. This is the guy that spent the most money on all these people, giving the world the gift of art, okay? So please remember, Medici is someone that invests in art, it's based on our time of the Renaissance, and it reflects perhaps the grandiosity of one Lorenzo di Medici. Um, anyway, so basically, the Medici, not only did they have a lot of money, but they also controlled. They were in the political control, you know, of, of the town, right? Uh, in this case, Florence, pardon me. In this case, Florence. So let's, let's start with Da Vinci, right? Uh, da Vinci, like we talked about Giotto and Cimabui, Da Vinci apprenticed. A young man was taken to the workshop of an older man uh, and he would work for the old man. He would paint for the older artist. And eventually when he got good enough, he went solo, he went independent. So at the beginning, you know, you have that uh, Da Vinci apprentices with Verrocchio, Andrea del Verrocchio in Florence, but eventually he leaves and goes off to Milan. So he's from Florence, but he goes off to Milan. And, uh, <clears throat> and then he later traveled to, Flor uh, to Rome. He traveled uh, a little bit around. He did science, he did art, he did music. He did engineering. That's what we call a Renaissance spirit, right? He's interested in all these things. And basically, you know, uh, we're going to see two qualities in Da Vinci's art that are going to be very important for you to talk about Renaissance art and other art. One is the balance of light and dark. Chiaroscuro. All this is in Italian, because of course it's from that time. Chiaroscuro light and dark, okay? Like that drama of light and dark. And, you know, with perspective, 
which he uses, remember, it was invented by Brunelleschi, with perspective, we have, especially with Mona Lisa, we have atmospheric, atmospheric perspective. Remember, there's two kinds of perspective. Linear perspective, right? Lines move to the center, and then there's the softer atmospheric perspective. So you're going to see both in, uh, in Da Vinci. I'm going to show you a couple of his works. They're all labeled. Uh, this is from your PowerPoints, which you should be checking regularly. Look at the Virgin of the Rocks. My God, that's chiaroscuro, light and dark. Look at the cave, look at the shadows in the cave back there. And then look at the whole, see what comes from the early Renaissance. Remember, we talked about the drama of the Middle Ages. Then we talked about, you know, the gold from uh, Istanbul. And then we also talked about, you know, the bodies and space. Well, look at it all coming together in this beautiful Madonna of the Rocks from 1485. And look, it's all a dialogue of the hands. Look at the hands, how they're telling a story. You know, the angel pointing, you know, uh, at, at St. John the Baptist, at, at Jesus, St. John the Baptist doing his little finger sign. Okay, look at that. Also look at the clarity of the composition. Let's review. If you look at this picture, if you look at this picture, you can see, you can see how it idealizes nature. What a beautiful cave. How are the forms of antiquity reflected? Look at the bodies. They're really well achieved. Also, look at the balance and the clarity in the composition and look at the emotional power. Anyway, that's the Madonna of the Rocks. And then look, of course, the Last Supper, okay? The Last Supper is, you know, a masterpiece in, in, in all of Western art. It was from 1495 to 1498. It was done in the refractory, that means the, the eating room, right? The, the, the dining room. Of a, of a place in, in Turin. Um, and basically, actually in, in Milan. And, uh, and basically, it was not done properly. Even the master, even the master da Vinci made mistake with the mixes. So it's flaking, it's falling apart. But here you see the clarity of the message, perspective at the service of what? Of religion. Where does it all go to Jesus in the center? So that is the Last Supper, 1495-1498, okay, um, and, uh, and here's a composition, uh, here's a, a, a comparison between the way he did it, Da Vinci did it, and the way another artist does it, Castaño. Look at the difference, look how perspective works for Da Vinci's, for Da Vinci, in Da Vinci's favor. Here are some sketches of uh, some of the apostles, you know, of Christ's uh, uh, colleagues. And, uh, and look at the drawings. Like I said, drawings before were thrown away, discarded. They were just preparatory, no good. And all of a sudden, they do start gaining value because these are such beautiful, beautiful drawings. And of course, let me finish our exposure of Michael of, uh, oh, by the way, look at the anatomical studies. Look how Da Vinci sort of, you know, he probably, there was a dead woman, pregnant dead woman, cuts them, you know, they would, they would go in midnight into the churches, into the cemeteries. They would probably have been killed if they were found out. And they're cutting body, cutting tissue so they can draw it. That's a scientific curiosity, okay? That's a scientific curiosity that these guys have. Now, uh, Mona Lisa is, you know, La Gioconda. La Gioconda is the wife of Il Giocondo. The guy was called Giocondo, so the other name for Mona Lisa is La Gioconda. She was a woman called Lisa Gerardini. And Gisela Gerardini must have been like 25. She was the wife of this Giocondo. And, and Leonardo portrayed her, and he kept this portrait to his death. So he obviously liked the portrait, or maybe he liked Lisa, who knows? Mona Lisa, beautiful Lisa. And what I want you to notice about this portrait is that basically the background, the background has, um, the background has a technique that Da Vinci used very much, and you need to remember another technique, sfumato. Sfumato comes from 
the smokiness. It means smokiness, so it's soft. It's not as hard and precise. And you have a lot of sumato. And then behind her, behind Lisa, behind Mona Lisa, you have atmospheric perspective. You have a river turning and twisting. And, uh, and basically, the character of the women is probably reflected by the landscape. Like we have a mysterious smile and then that landscape, and that says whatever there is to be said about that woman. Okay, so um, that is uh, that is Da Vinci, and we could spend a whole semester talking about Da Vinci, but we gotta keep on going. And now I would like to talk to you about someone you know a little bit less, Donato Bramante, okay? We're gonna talk about Donato Bramante, and basically, you know, he is from Urbino. He's from a different area. And, um, and basically, he is an architect. He is an architect. And look at his, some of his architecture. They're round buildings, because he's studying Greece and Roman buildings. Round buildings, like this Tempieto, okay, in, in, in Rome, all right? And again, the model is Greek and classic antiquity. What do I want you to remember about Bramante? Why is he so important? He is the guy that made the original plan for St. Peter's Cathedral. Okay, the cathedral where the Pope uh, sort of offers mass, you know, officiates mass in Rome. The, the Pope, the leader of the Christian Catholic Church. And basically, this is his original plan. You have it there. I'm showing it to you. But of course, he just did the plan, right? Because he couldn't finish, he couldn't go through with it. You know who finished it? Michelangelo. Michelangelo actually, besides doing the last sub, um, besides doing the final judgment, besides doing the sculpture of David and so many remarkable achievements, Michelangelo was also an architect and he finished Bramante's work in St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. So, you know, just know that Bramante started, he did the design, and of course, you know, it's a circle in a square. The design of a circle in a square because Bramante loved classical antiquity and round buildings, okay? So by the time Bramante died in 1514, there were only four crossing piers, like some of the structure was built, that's it. So it was really Michelangelo's project uh, when he finished it in 1546. Now let's talk about the guy we all love to talk about, and that's Michelangelo Buonarroti. He was born in 1474, he died in 1564, so we're talking 80, 86 years or something. I mean, that's a, that's a long, fruitful life. And Michelangelo had, we have a word for him. He's like the, the angry genius. He's like Steve Jobs, right? Terribilita is the terrible one, okay? So here's Terribilita. He was terrible, Terribilita. He was good, and he knew it, and he was impatient, and you know, I'm Michelangelo, what's your problem? Um, there's actually a joke that Da Vinci would poke fun at Michelangelo, because Michelangelo, even though he painted beautifully, and we know the frescoes of uh, the final judgment and the creation of the world, you know, he sculptured the David. So Da Vinci would laugh at him and say, ah, right, you know, sculptures are like menial workers, like laborers, like employees, because they get all dirty, you can't listen to music, you get the chips fall on your face, you come out all dirty from your work, whereas I, the painter, some woman can be playing the harp for me, I just put soft brush on the canvas, and I'm, I'm an artist. You, you're just, you know, a blue collar worker. So anyway, we have this guy, Michelangelo, and he was a good friend. He came from money, he, he had a certain social standing, so he was friend of the Medici's. The Medici's has the best art collection in town. So Michelangelo would go in and out of the Medici garden, of the Medici collection, look at these things, create work based on the Medici collection. The Medici's had Greek statues, Roman statues, all kinds of statues. So that was his formation. That's how he evolved as a sculptor. And basically, who is he looking at? Giotto, right? Masaccio. 
Donatello, the guys from the Quattrocento that came slightly before him, okay? And basically, at this time, and if we think back to the, um, and if we think back to the birth of Venus by Botticelli, there is this philosophy that a lot of these people on Michelangelo too, Neoplatonism, Neoplatonism. You know, they're looking at the, at the philosophy of Neoplatonism. And basically, Neoplatonism says that you can, you can enjoy the antiquity of Greece and Rome. You can enjoy the pagans. When you're not religious, so you're Christian, or if you're not Christian, you are pagan, pagan, not Christian. So basically, Neoplatonism was a way to have the best of both worlds, okay? We are Christian, but we admire pagan art and philosophy. If they produce such beautiful things, they can't have been that bad. They could have been Christian. It's just Christ had not been born. So, Buonarroti, uh, Michelangelo also is, um, enjoys that, uh, you know, that religion. And like Donatello, at the end of his life, Michelangelo goes dark. So they celebrate the body, they celebrate the sensuousness, and then later on, as they get older, they get more conservative, they get more maybe afraid of death. Maybe they wonder if they had uh, been a bad influence on other people. There's something very funny about the final words of this, of this guy. But let's just look at this stuff. I mean, look at the Pietà. This guy was 25 years old. 1500 and he carves out this you know this statue of 1500 of whenever you see a dead christ with his mother mary holding him we call it pieta pieta sort of like that the piousness the sort of the, the the love of the mother for the dead son you know that sadness of a woman that buries her son look at that pieta 1500 marble you know carve carve that's very hard look at um Look at the expressions. The Virgin looks like a teenager, and Christ is already a grown man, so it's funny that way. And then, of course, you know, in 1501, from 1501 to 1504, Michelangelo carved the ideal, the universal ideal, perhaps even today, with everything that's been said and done and how it's changed, but still the David, okay? Perhaps the sexiest uh, male sculptor in the world. And you can see, you know, it's, it's, it's like the antiquity, right? It's like going back to Greece and Rome, and it's the posture of youth, right? Of youth, you can see the veins in his hand. You can see um, his, his ideal, and it's about the contender, a young man fighting a giant from a Bible story, but the young man is very secure in his prowess, in his ability to beat adversity. So that's David, 1501, 1504. And then, of course, you know, uh, uh, Michelangelo worked uh, a lot for the popes, uh, especially for Julius II. He did a tomb for him. And in the context of that, we also have these sculptures, you know, that he did. And they're called the slaves. And the slaves are very exciting because it's not like they're abstract, but it's like men emerging from the stone. You know, they're emerging from the stone. So they're very exciting that way. Uh, there's also Moses. Uh, a picture of Moses, um, I mean, a picture, a sculpture of Moses. But look, so this is Michelangelo's sculpture. Look at his references. When Michelangelo was working, this sculpture was dug from the earth. This came from the earth. This is the Laocoon, a classical sculpture from a thousand years before. And look at the, look how exquisite it is. So that's why Michelangelo has such, you know, has such powerful models. And then, of course, there is Michelangelo's painting. Michelangelo painted frescoes. Remember, we're here we're talking about tempera early on, 13, 1400. We're talking about oil painting, right? Because they can be transported. And we're talking about fresco. These are the frescoes of the Sistine Chapel. The Sistine Chapel is a little church in the Vatican, not St. Peter's, the big church, but a little church that was used by the Pope for his smaller masses, right? So personal mass church, look at the Sistine Chapel. And you know, in it, Michelangelo was commissioned, was asked to paint 
the creation of the world. And he paints this, sorry, I think my phone right, and, and he's doing this creation of the world um, in fresco, and because of terribilità, he fought with all his assistants. <laughs> so uh, nobody could help him. He painted it pretty much by himself, almost going blind with a scaffold, painting like that. And remember, you gotta bet, get the wall wet, the plaster wet, paint on that section. So everything by little sections. That is the achievement of the Sistine Chapel. And of course, he mixes the story of the Bible with um, with characters from Greek and Roman antiquity in terms of the look of these people, the prophets come almost from classical antiquity, all right? Even though they're, they're, some of them are from the church, but the figures are from classical antiquity and the story is from the Bible. Um, here are some scenes. I'm just gonna show you some scenes in the video. This is the creation of the world, okay? Um, this is the creation of Adam. E.T. from home, the famous finger. I mean, this is an iconography. An iconography, the meaning of these images are now used for other meanings today because this was so successful. Okay, so successful. This is, uh, Michelangelo created the look of God. <laughs> so why is God an old man with long hair, long white hair and a long white beard? Michelangelo created this idea. Um, anyway, so here you have some more pictures. And then a funny thing happened, kind of like Ghiberti. He did the doors at 1400. They become the doors of paradise because Michelangelo loves them. And then Michelangelo comes, I mean, and then Ghiberti comes back and does the doors again. Another set of doors 25 years later. Well, the same thing happened with the Sistine Chapel. He first does the Bible, right, the creation. And then a few years later, like 20 years later, he does the final judgment. So here's an older guy and he does this very, very powerful. It's like the Renaissance is changing. It's no longer so innocent. It's no longer so balanced. The world is changing. People are getting a little bit more depressed. And so we have the transition from the Renaissance to the next, you know, the next period, which will be the Baroque or Mannerism a more exaggerated Renaissance, and look at the last judgment. Okay, this is a picture of God coming to the world, passing judgment and saying, you are going to hell, you are going to heaven. So it's a very powerful picture, and it's also a fresco, a huge fresco on the back of the Sistine Chapel. And now we get to the young one, the sweet one, the kind one, a younger man called Raphael. Rafael um, Sancio, and Rafael, he was younger. He was younger than the other two. Um, he was younger than the other two. He lived from 1483 to 1520. So he was 37 years old when he died. So, and basically if Michelangelo and Da Vinci perhaps had, you know, they weren't that friendly to each other. They had some compete competition going on. Um, you know, Raphael earned both men's uh, confidence because he was younger, because he copied them both. And he did his own thing. When I say he copied them both, is that he, he paid respect to both older artist styles. So, and he was very successful. He was a successful artist in his own time. He synthesized Leonardo and Michelangelo and look at these Madonnas. Now, perhaps it's the most accessible. You see a calendar with these women, with these Madonnas in any country person's home all over Latin America, Europe. I mean, it's just so beautiful, the United States. People just love it because it's not, look at, look at this. This is called La Belle Jardiniere. Again, a Madonna, the, the, the Virgin Mary with her son and often with St. John the Baptist. This is from 1507. Compare it to the Madonna of the Rocks, okay, with Da Vinci. It's different, but they're all clean, clear, stable pictures. What is the composition? I've asked you to tell me what are composition when you talk, write about art. What is the composition? It's a triangle. It's a very stable form. The Virgin, her head at the top, and then the two kids at the bottom. So that gives the composition stability, okay? Um, now, 
when uh, uh, Raphael also worked for the popes, you know, and uh, Pope Leo X called Raphael to work, um, to work in Rome and to make these frescoes of the stanzas, of the rooms of the Pope. Uh, there's one stanza called Stanza de la Signatura, where the Pope would sign his documents. And here you have this remarkable model, this remarkable uh, mural, rather, okay, that basically encapsulates a little bit of the history of, of, of the to who's who. You know those pictures where you have all the people from the rock bands, all the people from the salsa world, Sergeant Peppers, like the Beatles, Sergeant Pepper. I know that's very old. I, you probably don't know who the Beatles are, but still, you know, look it up, Sergeant Pepper. So this is the first of those because he brings out all the famous people that the Renaissance guys were looking at. He puts them all together in one picture. And this very, very exciting picture is called the School of Athens, 1510, 1511. He paints himself, there is Raphael. He paints Da Vinci, he paints Michelangelo, he paints all of them, and they're all hanging out and talking with the famous guys from antiquity. Let me just give you some close up. Look at that. That's supposed to be Michelangelo, I mean, Da Vinci, with his finger pointed up. And if you look here, if you look here, that's, um, let's see, who's this? Um, uh, Bramante. Bramante is working on chalk on the ground. And who's this? Um, this is Raphael hiding in the background. That's the young painter himself. And look at this guy in the corner, doesn't play well with others. That's Michelangelo. So he's a younger painter honoring the masters of his time as the masters of his time are hanging out with the philosophers of antiquity. So this is a very, very special painting that um, I love it. I love it. And, um, and, you know, and during Raphael's time, he also had people copy his paintings to sell them, you know, in engravings, printmakings. Prints were made of the paintings to sell them. But we're going to stop this session right now because we have a couple more monsters that we want to talk about, notably Giorgione and Titian. So let's take a break and then we're going to finish afterwards. Thank you.